and come back and talk about the Olympics. Welcome back to DEF CON 3. Now joining me is Admiral, former Admiral Joe Sestak. And he's a guy that I've always wanted to have on this show because he wears three hats. You can talk to him about anything. He's a former three-star Admiral in the United States Navy, former Congressman, and a former White House Director for Anti-Terrorism. So he's a guy who knows about an awful lot of stuff in great detail. So we're thrilled to have you back. Admiral Sestak, welcome back to DEF CON 3. And it's good to be with you, KT. Thanks. Okay, first I want you to put on your White House counterterrorism hat. We have seen in the last, well, really in the last year, but in the last couple of weeks especially, an increase of Hezbollah attacks against Israeli citizens worldwide. I mean, it's, right. it's India, Singapore, Thailand, Bulgaria, even Washington, D.C. What do you make of it? What are they up to? Well, I think that we're trying to go tit for tat for their suspicions, right suspicions probably, that Israel has been involved in taking down quite a number of their nuclear scientists within the borders of Iran. It can't go against uh, Israel within the borders of Israel. They've done a pretty good job of having homeland defense, and they can't go against those outposts of diplomats. The embassies are pretty secure. So now they're going, as you saw in Bulgaria, against a less protected threat, and that's the civilian that's out there. There's a report that there's an Iranian hit squad somewhere in Europe that is bent upon having the 40th anniversary of the Munich assassination of Israel's delegation and its athletes uh, be one where they once again are able to take them down. I think that London has done a superb job thus far of preparing for that. Israel itself has sent its own private guards for these, uh, this delegation, but at the end of the line, as you well know, KT, from your own defense experience, it's how well we can track the intelligence, the munitions, the terrorists themselves, because if they get to that last moment right there where they're able to pull the trigger in that small defense bubble, it means 90% failure has been there. And I think that's why intelligence gathering is still key, much like I saw at the White House. All right, so in other words, there, you think that there is a hit squad headed trying to figure out a way to get to London to take out the Israeli athletes at the Olympics? I don't know that. I only know that I think it was the BBC that gave reports that there was intelligence that was being bandied about that there was one. But look, we need to make the assumption mm -hmm. that there will be on this anniversary, the 40th anniversary, an attempt to try to make a name once more that Iran supporting Hezbollah and others is about uh, the power that it can rot uh, as a Persian nation. And so I think that we have to be on our guard extremely high right now. Well, what are they up to, though? It's not, it's a tit for tat, yes. But is there, is Iran, they must realize that if they do something against, say, Israeli athletes at the Olympics, if they do more and more of these, at some point the Israelis are going to retaliate either against Hezbollah, which is the Iranian terrorist proxy, a hit squad group, if you will, or against Iran itself. Do they, is Iran really trying to pick a fight that they expect to have to fight? Well, I think what they are trying to do is to recognize that right now the biggest item on the plate in the Middle East region is its pursuit, Iran's pursuit of a nuclear weapon, much like you had the ambassador just on with you. That's what it's really all about. And right now, as you saw by the Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, where initially he said, we will take care of this because it's Iran that caused it, backed off mm -hmm. and said, no, there isn't going to be anything overt, but much like Goldie Meir did in 1972, we're still going to get them covertly, those who did it. He doesn't want to upset a very tenuous moment in, in history out there where these sanctions have a possibility, I can't yet say probability, of having Iran stop its pursuit of nuclear weapons. In the meantime, it is able to do these less major types of damage out there, knowing that everything right now is on the table for the United States to lead the world to bring about a peaceful resolution. So I think it's able to do a little bit more damage on a lower level right now, knowing that no one wants Israel or anyone else to strike Iran and get these talks, well, talks when they occur, but these sanctions to look like they have no potential benefit of stopping Iran's pursuit. All right, now I want to switch now to your Navy hat. You're a three-star uh, <laughs> naval officer, service warfare officer. You've looked at the Persian Gulf. You've looked at a possible conflict the United States and Iran or Israel, United States and Iran or all the countries in the region might have. 
Walk me through what happens in the Strait of Hormuz if there's some kind of an Iranian blockade of the Strait of Hormuz. We saw just two weeks ago there was a fishing vessel that harassed an American vessel. Well, what happens right. if that was an Iranian Revolutionary Guard vessels that came up to U.S. military vessels? Walk me through what happens. Quick, fast, what? No. This is, if there was to be a conflict about the closure of the Straits of Hormuz, this would be long in days, in fact, long in months, and heavy in assets, very heavy in assets. Iran has what you know are called asymmetric weapons. That is very inexpensive, but can do a lot of damage and a lot of delay before you can do further types of warfare. For example, over 2,000 sophisticated mines that can lay in the Straits of Ramos that is only four miles wide on the navigable portions of it. And it can let two, three, four ships go through thinking it's still clean and it explodes on the fifth or sixth one. All of a sudden the Straits is clo are closed. It would take us months to clear those Straits. And if we do so, just 20 miles away are scores of mobile anti-ship missiles that we would have to protect against. We would probably have to take them down. And to take them down, we would then have to take down the anti-air uh, defense systems that Iran has purchased from Russia. This isn't Libya. This isn't Iraq. They have some fairly capable systems there, as well as the ability to send hundreds of missiles into Israel, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf Cooperative States that may give us bases so the Air Force can do their job along with the naval forces, as well as Southeast and Turkey. Can we do this? Yes. But this is, would be one where the consequences, the dimension of the consequences of how hard this would be isn't well known. And so therefore, that's why you see we're being prudent to put, make sure we have two aircraft carry battle groups there. We already have mine sweeping vessels as well as helicopters. But to do this well, to keep those straits open, would take a, a under warfare conditions, would take quite a bit of time as the economy of the world suffers. Yeah, so all the people who were talking about a potential Israeli attack against Iran, Iran counterattacks by mining the Strait of Hormuz, we clean up the Strait of Hormuz and everything's over in a ha right. handy dandy two days or two weeks, that's not going to happen. You're talking about a protracted regional war that really brings in a number of countries in the region, including the United States. Absolutely right. Look, yeah. there are, it is why you see that an X-ray missile uh, radar has been placed in the United Arab Emirates in, mm -hmm. uh, in Qatar. I've forgotten which one. It'll be the third one out there to better see these missiles as they're launched from a short distance away in order to have a probability of shooting at least many of them down. And we don't have a perfect defense system out there against scores and scores of missiles being shot. Now, Iran may decide just to lay mines and do nothing else, but then how comfortable do we feel to have our eight or so minesweeping vessels there, along with other nations, where we feel that at a moment they could just press a button and take down a few of those ships. And so this is the dilemma that we have to try to, at first, while not taking the military option off the table, has been said earlier, try to resolve it by tough, even tougher economic financial sanctions that hurt this country to dissuade it from any type of aggressive activity. Okay, well, I have time for one quick last question. Your yes. congressman hat, sequestration cuts. We're talking about major cuts in the United States defense budget, potentially affecting everything for all the services, as well as military equipment and benefits for retirees and medical benefits for existing um, current active duty personnel. What do you think? Big mistake? Well, I look at it that this is a unique opportunity for the military. First off, when the Vietnam War ended, when the Korean War ended, and even the Cold War ended, defense was cut by 30%. This sequestration with the other cuts that have occurred will only be half of that, about 15 percent. Two things to keep in mind. I think that the Defense Department can be a lot more accountable in how it procures its weapon systems. As you might well know, probably, KT, from your background, in 2008 programs, that year alone in its programs, we had a $300 billion cost overrun. Because when they come to Congress, to when I was there, and said, we need another aircraft carrier, it will cost $11 billion dollars.
the confidence factor that it was to be $11 billion was less than 15%, 50% that that was the rice price tag. So you have this cost overrun that we have to get under control, much like we want HHS and, and, and uh, NASA and all to get their cost control okay. better. Second is we have to change warfare to knowledge base where you know the adversary is and you can take them out with less quantity. Okay. And that's the real change to have. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that whirlwind tour of all three of your hats. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for having Joe me, Katie. Sestak. Hey, thanks for everyone joining us for a whirlwind tour around those flashpoints around the planet. We have talked to some of the leading experts in the field, brought you into the discussion with your questions. So that's it for DEF CON 3 this week. National security crises are no doubt going to continue, but until next week, you're on your own trying to figure them out.